you want to drive faster? Listen in as Kinch Randell, an SCCA National Trophy winner and multi-time pro solo champion himself, interviews the best autocrossers in the land. He talks fast and drives even faster. And now here's your host, Kinch Rendell. Hello, hello. So this is part two in the Solo National Rookies of 2017. So each show will have a handful of guests here. And there's different numbers of guests based on how long they talk. We're trying to break this down into not super long episodes. So we'll get a couple more of those in there. And if you already missed out or you think you missed out and you were a rookie, let me know. I've not finished recording. Basically, I got a whole bunch of these recorded to begin with. And I have a handful of people I know of that I'm going to contact and get them recorded. But there's probably some of you out there that are going, hey, what about me? I had an experience also at Nationals, SCCA Solo Nationals 2017. And hopefully this will be something I hear good feedback on and people like. If so, maybe we'll look at doing it again in 2018, 2019, and who knows how much further out than that. So let me know what you think of this and definitely listen up and see what you think of some of these rookies. And once again, give us feedback and tell them if you heard them. Tell them thanks for spending the time and sharing their thoughts and experiences. And what do you remember from your first nationals? I'm trying to think back. For me, it was basically, maybe I said this in some of these, but just blown away back in the day like hey there's 60 s2000s wow there's like 10 or 15 type r integras that that was what i really noticed just the extreme size of things and this was back at the lincoln airport so grippy concrete that was also all cracked up in places so what do you remember share that online let us know thanks for listening this is terrence pearson welcome to the show Thank you for making the time here and hooking up with me in the middle middle of the day there. So where are you, and is it still the middle of the day for you? Yeah, it, it's around 20 minutes till 11 here. Uh, I'm in Anchorage, Alaska. I said I live actually in a little town called Peters Creek. It's about 20 miles outside of Anchorage, but uh, I work in Anchorage. So how much do you get to autocross in Anchorage, Alaska? How often? Well, it's, it's kind of an interesting... Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, we've our season usually runs from the first of May through the middle of September. You know, you've got a couple of different clubs up here. Actually, about three, two clubs that actually, you know, uh, push autocross. You've got the Porsche Club of Alaska, and then you've got the Sports Car Club of America, and that that do the solo events. I'm a member of both, and then you've got the Alaska Sports Car Club Lines Club. They actually do some wheel-to-wheel uh, racing and time trials at, a, at an abandoned airport. Well, actually, it's not an abandoned airport, an airport up in Toke, Alaska. But for autocross, it's basically from May until uh, May until September, about 16 events a season. Oh, wow. So you can get quite a bit in there. And how long have you been autocrossing? Uh, you know, I started back, you know, I autocrossed back in 2000, and I guess it was around 99 to 2000, uh, back in North Carolina. I had a, a, I think it was like a 94 Escort GT that I ran, and, uh, street touring STS when 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 they were trying to get tuner tuner guys and gals involved back in the day when there was STS and STR and I ran that some there but you know I, I retired from the military uh, three years ago uh, 24 years active duty and you know from 2003 until you know I retired in 2011 it was pretty pretty hectic and I really didn't get a chance to to participate like I'd like to and then once I retired, you know, I kind of picked it back up. And, and up here in Alaska, you know, I, I became more involved in the SCCA and, you know, I became more involved in actual the, the club itself. Uh, and then, you know, it just naturally came that, you know, I started autocrossing again. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's just equipment or, or, you know, time, but, you know, I found myself in a position of actually being competitive. I mean, out of, you know, we have roughly anywhere from 30 to 50 competitors at, at an event, uh, and I never really saw myself as competitive until I restarted up here. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of went from there. So I've been, since 2012, 13 ish, uh, I mean, I've run multiple cars. I mean, I ran a, a uh, the first car I guess I ran up here was my son's WRX, and then following year I ran a, a Mazda RX-8 and really didn't prep it 
the the first year that I pushed hard, I have I've got a 04 Z06 that I ran in A Street, and you know it really wasn't prepped either. I mean, I threw a set of NTO fives on it and and ran it, but then uh, got hooked up in 16 with a Fiesta ST, co-drove co drove it with Kent Hamilton. Uh, it was my car, and he co drove with me. He's out actually out of he went to Colorado school in Colorado. I remember uh, him but, driving some maybe four door sedan really neon. really fast. A neon. <laughs> yeah, maybe and neon also. He, was, I don't think it mattered what he was there. in, if I remember if I'm thinking of the right guy. <laughs> uh, well kids uh he's a you know, he's a multi multi time uh rallycross national champion in, in mod front wheel drive. Okay. So you know so I, I got hooked up with Kent, and and we campaigned that Fiesta ST, and, I mean, we absolutely dominated in 16 with it. Uh, and, you know, the, you know the, then I went from a Fiesta ST last year, well, actually this year, in SCCA I ran, uh, you know, D Street uh, WRX. Uh, and my wife, she co-drove with me this year, and... Um, you know, she drove the Fiesta last year. She picked it up about halfway halfway through the season. And you know, we're trying to build the ladies' uh, class up up here. And so I ran the D Street uh, WRX, and and I kind of thought, hey, I was doing well, and I thought that I could. Uh, I wanted to go to nationals, and uh, so I basically put a put a feeler out on on Facebook to some of my friends. And I, I mean, you know, the folks that that have helped me through the last, probably I'd say, uh, three years, or at least the last two years when I was, when I was, I felt like I was being, you know, <laughs> you know, I felt like I was doing okay. Uh, you know, I started out with Darren Seltzer trying to, you know, he ran a Fiesta SC at Nationals about three or three or two or three, three years ago, I guess, and worked with him on setup on my Fiesta. And then, you know, this past year between uh, Dennis Sparks, and uh, Perry Edelbaum and you know Tamara Hunt and those folks. I ran into them and, and got to know them at, at the national convention. Um, you know they helped me. It was just an amazing opportunity. So what happened was Kent ended up uh, cross posting the uh, the you know my request in uh, I guess Rocky Mountain Solo, and that's where you know uh, Brian Kelly said, hey you know I'm going to nationals. I've got a Mazda Speed Miata. You know, you want know, to co-drive it? And I said, "Hey, I'll I'll do it." So you know, that's kind of the, the path to how I got to, to my first nationals. So, um, yeah, you know, tell, went down there driving it. Yeah, what did, what was it like when you got there? What what were your first like? Oh wow, big, not big. What were your, what what did you think? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it was. I mean, I'd rate. I'd ran solo in you know, East Tennessee region up at, you know, a couple of times at Bristol, Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, but just the sheer number of, of competitors, I mean, you know, it's kind of staggering. I mean, it was, it was nice to roll in. I came in on a, I got there, I flew in on Saturday uh, and went straight to, uh, to the air park. And, you know, that they were running the pro solo then, I guess, and, and uh, was able to get hooked up with, you know, Dennis and Jordan, you know, Dennis Sparks and Jordan Towns and their WRX because, you know, I've talked to them a lot on Facebook. And, and of course, uh, Tamara Hunt and Andrew Christnick was there. So, it, it, you know, it kind of worked out really nice to be able to know some people through social media coming there. But, you know, just the sheer, you know, the size of the, the venue. I mean, people really don't understand. I mean, Alaska, we're... <laughs> You know, landmass, we're the largest state in the United States. I mean, we cover pretty much, we can cover from coast to coast. But just the, we have a really hard time with finding pavement up here. So, you know, our courses are, are incredibly tight and small. I mean, you know, uh, our biggest course, I think, was, uh, it's about 300 by 600. It's, a, it's in Houston, Alaska. It's called Houston Middle School Parking Lot. And like I said, 300 by 600 is just small. Uh, but that's not, the, I mean, the smallest course that we ran, we run on up here, uh, at North Pole Middle School, which is actually in North Pole, Alaska. Um, uh, it's, uh, the elementary school or middle school there. And it's, uh, you know, 270 by a hundred and, you know, 180 feet. 
uh, unobstructed, doesn't have any. So when I showed up at, at Nationals, I was, number one, I was amazed. It took me 13 minutes to walk the course, <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know, but the, but the people were just amazing. I mean, you know, it, it, yeah, I, you expect it. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, the SCCA, anything that, you know, up here, I mean, when folks go up here, I mean, incredibly welcoming environment. And then, of course, at, at Nationals, it was welcoming, too. Yeah, no kidding. Can you tell me anything that you think you would do different next time at Nationals? Anything you would change after being there once? Well, so uh, sage advice from Dennis Sparks. Um, you know, he told me, he says, hey, this is your first Nationals. He says, just come down here and have fun on your first one. And, of course, Kent, Kent Hamilton, same thing. Um, you know, you know, I have I had expectations. I mean, I'd done well last year. I I was really I was doing really well this year up here, uh, and I'm competitive. I mean, you can ask anybody up here in Alaska. I mean, Kent or uh, you know any of the folks that uh, that are that are racing up here, how competitive I am. So you know, naturally, I go in there thinking, hey, you know, I'd like to I'd like to do well, but you know, it, it was. You know, it was just it, it was a bridge too far. And the thing is, Dennis says, "Hey, just go in with no expectations and have fun." And and that's what I did. I went in. Uh, it was like I said, going in. It was great to have Brian there. It was great to have a car. He had competed the year, you know, he trophied the year before. He'd been there, I guess, a couple times. So he kind of had it down. Uh, but you know, things that I would do different. Um, you know, I plan on going. You know next year i mean uh, that's the intent um my wife will probably she'll probably fly down we're looking at bringing a, maybe a couple of folks coming down um uh, you know i think number one driving your own car i mean it, i either can't, can't say enough about having your own equipment because you know it i came into a car that that you know, I'd owned Miatas before, but I'd never owned a Mazda Speed, and I mean, I struggled really bad. Uh, you know, the courses were were way faster than I'd ever, you know, uh, ran up here in, in Alaska, and just the sheer, you know, the size and the and the length of time. I mean, I, I came back and I I kind of wrote a couple of little articles that you know we float around in our our uh, you know our newsletter about how you know for for me, not, you know, everybody talked about the concrete and said, hey, you know, the concrete's going to be the thing that you're going to struggle with. Well, to be honest with you, for me, <laughs> concrete was the farthest thing. You know, it was an incredible amount of grip. Uh, car was well prepared. Uh, it was just the, the sheer speed and the length of time that you were traveling at that speed. So it took me a while to, to adapt to that right off the bat. Uh, the car was a challenge because... Uh, you know, all the Mazda drivers out there. I mean, Mazda Speed, you know, it's power band, and that uh, six-speed transmission is just in a really kind of an odd place. So, you know, being having to shift to third gear in an autocross was, was foreign <laughs> uh, to me, and it was it was difficult, but took a lot of advice from some folks that says, hey, you know, just, uh, you know, get it in gear and leave it there and, and, and just – drive the car so but you know things for me that'll be different next year is you know i'll have my own equipment um and i think you know i intend on trying to we're we're looking for a bigger venue up here to be able to uh, you know to be able to at least get some folks exposed to that that speed and and size Uh, so you know that that's something I think that I'm looking at trying to do different. Uh, you know, thought about trying to go down to Crows just to, oh, yeah. you know, just to, just to, you know, just to recalibrate my, my brain. And then of course, uh, I like East Street. I mean, it was fun. I mean, it, it was it was a huge class, and uh, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of good folks in that class. You know, uh, but for me, you know, I, I hung around with, uh, you know the folks over in Super Street, and I've, I've got a, a 2015 Cayman S. Um, I, don't, I don't expect to be competitive. I, I expect to drive better than I did last year, but 
I'm planning on coming down and I'd like to run the Cayman S and Super Street because <laughs> it's just fun. It's just it's just a good it's just a good bunch. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I I like the excitement and you know I like a challenge. So you know, I think that when you go into that that uh, class, it'll be different. But uh, it'll be different for me because I'll. I feel like I'll be more comfortable. I'll be in a car that I'll campaign. I bought the Cayman last last summer. Uh, ran it. I ran it at all the Porsche events. So I was flipping between the Porsche events and the SECA between the, the the Cayman and the WRX. So you know I was splitting my attention between two cars, and that's difficult. I wouldn't. You know, I mean, a lot of people could do it, but you know I'm just you know if you want to if you want to win championships, I think if you want to do well. Even you know regionally. I mean, you know, this is this is what we have here in Alaska, and I'm thankful that we have it. Uh, but you know, even here, you know, you take your eye off the ball, and you've got folks that are that are willing and wanting to, you know, to to you know be at the top of the ladder. So, oh, for sure, and, and that's that's where you jumped into a car that yes, you had to shift. I was thinking when you said that, I'm like, oh yeah, you just got a car if you haven't been shifting to especially third and back to second very much. So if you can jump in co-drives, beggars can't be choosers. Had you hopped in a WRX or a Porsche, I think you would have been drastically one more thing that your brain wouldn't have had to try to figure out. So that, and that's where I, well, I mentioned, it, I don't know if I recorded in the previous, one of the previous guests, but the car I'm looking at outside was .002 seconds behind first place in STR years ago by a guy who had never driven it, but he was used to the S2000 right. platform. So that, that's one thing if you... Right. If you all can't get to nationals with your own car, definitely try to get at least the same platform. And if you get the same car, I've I've known of people that have won or done really well. For one, I think their expectations are a little bit lower, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I'm familiar with this somewhat, mostly," and then just go drive. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know, it, you know, when I got there on uh, on Saturday, and I was watching, you know, the spectating the pros. Uh, you know the the actually your uh, the pro champ in H Street had his the Fiesta ST there. And of course, he uh, I'm trying to remember his name. I apologize, uh, but you know he he drives a Camaro now for I guess for the GM training team there, and he ran it in the in the nationals. He wasn't going to drive his Fiesta, and he was like, "Hey, you want to drive Fiesta?" And it was so tempting because you know this is a you know, this is a nationally prepped car that just won the, you know, pros in a street. And I was so tempted to do it. And I'm so glad that I didn't do it because I think that if I had done it, I still would have had to contend with all the things that I, that I wasn't prepared for. Like I said, the size, the speed. And, you know, I think that I would have beat myself up just, you know, really bad. So, so I go back and say, Hey, Dennis Sparks gave me the best advice that I could have is go in with no expectations and have fun. Yeah. Uh, right. So, but you are, you are right. I mean, you know, that, that, you know, if you've got a car that you can roll into that you've driven, I think you would, you would, you will definitely do, you know, do better than I did. But, you know, I'm, I'm just thankful that I, I got to go. Oh, exactly. I think you were probably mentioned Mark Scroggs, who has been a previous guest on the podcast and Yahoo. Yep. Who somewhat destroyed D Street this year in that uh, 2016 Chevy Camaro 2.0 liter turbo? As I'm looking at the results yeah. here, <laughs> kind, of, kind of crazy for sure. Any other thoughts or suggestions you have for anybody? No, I mean I think um, you know uh, first thing is I'd say is is do it. Um, you know, you, you, yeah, I had not done it. Uh, you know, I had run into some health problems uh, about a year ago. Uh, that kind of made me, you know, reassess things in life, I guess you'd say. And, you know, I was at a point, I said, hey, you know, this may be the only chance that I get to do this. And, um, you know, I'd kick myself if I got to a position where I wasn't able to do it. I mean, I'm 52 years old. Uh, so, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, I mean, Paul Newman started late in life, but I don't expect to be pulling a Paul Newman, but, uh, you know, I think that number one, you just to go and do it and have the experience. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm more excited this coming year about taking folks from here down 
to race because, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm kind of smiling right now because, you know, even my, my wife, you know, she's been racing, a, you know, she's been at it now going on, this is her second, second season. And she did, she's done incredibly well. But, you know, there's folks that, that I want to, to go down with me and, and have our own contingent there because that's the thing, too, that's so amazing about Nationals is you've got – I was adopted by, by, you know, by Brian and, uh, you know, the folks out of Colorado. I, you know, that was, that was great. But there's something about having your own group of, uh, you know, your folks from back home with you. So I was by myself, you know, I, I slept in a rental Jeep the whole time that I was there pretty much. Uh, but like I said, you know, just, yeah, do it, commit to doing it. You know, uh, like I said, don't be afraid to, to reach out to folks like on social media, because like I said, you know, I can't thank folks like, like I said, like Dennis and, and Jordan and Tamara and Perry and, Darren and Andrew, all of those folks are what made my experience at Nationals, you know, a really great one. Although next, you know, next season, it'll be, you know, yeah, I, I expect, like I said, to be in my own car. And, you know, I, I if I'm in my own car, then I'm going to be, I'll be a little bit more uh, comfortable. But, you know, I, I plan on being as serious as I can be, but you just can't lose sight of having fun because that's really what it's all about. Yeah, especially if that's what helps you compete the best or do not really compete the best, do the best you can do because that's all this really is. It's not we don't play defense on each other. So. Oh no, no, no! But you know, you can you can see the like I said when it came down in Super Street, you know, to the you know the last runs there were just oh, it was amazing. Oh, it was just well, you know, Super Street was amazing, and then you know over on the other side with you know. Uh, with uh, Tamara and uh, that that was just amazing. Over, I guess they're running uh, in CSP or yeah, DSP or well, CSP or DSP uh, was just uh, amazing to to be a part of that and watch that. But yeah, you know, like I said, I think uh, like I said, I think that you know, it's it's like I said, it goes back to having fun and uh, you know, try not to get frustrated i mean i you know this this coming season will be interesting up here in alaska because uh like i said you know i'll be driving a different car for the probably the fourth fifth year in a row so uh but hopefully i've got a better start this season than i had last year because oh, yeah. i'm driving it now in the snow <laughs> <laughs> exactly be like let's go out there that's like rally cross practice basically yeah and you, you're mentioning tamara hunt oh. ending up second in dsp so d street prepared right there in the that, hunt for that, sure. Yeah, she's. Um, that, I mean, you know, everybody was pulling. I mean, everybody was pulling for each other. But like I said, uh, you know, she's there. I mean, in the ladies, that's something that. Uh, like I said, I'm. I, you know, she she's running an open. You know, she's not running a ladies class, but. Uh, I think that's that's cool, and I think that. You know, we're really pushing hard up here to try to get our our ladies class built up. Uh, we've got, a, I guess we've got about six or seven ladies that are, that are regularly attending. So between, you know, between the SCCA and the Porsche club, 10 events in SCCA and six in, in Porsche, you know, the, that we can get that same group. Cause the thing is we have the same core group, uh, you know, running. Yeah. Do you guys uh, have any road on, courses around you anywhere? No, actually I mentioned the Alaska sports car club, Lions club, um, they are the only, uh, we run it at, uh, Tok Air, basically it's the Tanacross airfield. It's a World War II airfield, uh, that's now owned by the Department of Natural Resources Bureau of Land Management, one of the two that they have. It's a tanker base and sports car club, Lions Club, uh, they have, they run comp rules. They have their own, uh, it's, you know, it's a club, uh, and, they run wheel to wheel, but they also do time trials on that airfield. We have no we have no road course uh, that's a purpose built track. Okay, so um, I'm just so, but yeah, I only brought that up because if you need higher speed, even if it's really short, I would definitely suggest either a road course somewhere or anything higher speed to get you used to. Because yeah, it sounds like Solo Nationals is so much larger than lots that are small that you really do need some high speed maneuvers. 
even if you can only do five cones sl- slalom and then do one sweeper or something, even individual well, elements. Right. And, and that's something. Um, I mean, I've run to ti- I run time trials. I haven't I I haven't ran wheel to wheel up here, but you know I've ran time trials for two two different years, and both years, I mean, I ran my my C five Z O six one year, and I ran. Uh, guy up in North Pole, Alaska, John Pearson, no relation, but ship, but, uh, he's got, he had a C6 Z06 that I ran and, and it, that was, that was great. Uh, so, you know, the intent would be that probably for spring Canacross, they do it in spring and they do it in the fall that will, that I'll probably go up and run the, the time trials just to, just to get a, get a feel. Uh, and then we may actually do a little bit of testing on the backside of one of the runways while they're up there with, uh, you know, some elements, because it's the only chance, like, you know, I was saying, it's the only chance that we'll have to be able to put, you know, autocross, because that's the difference, I mean, there's a big difference between uh, setting it up as a, uh, as an autocross, uh, you know, as an autocross versus a time trial, because the time trial is set up with the, uh, as a, as a true road course without, you know, with cones uh, versus, putting elements of an autocross in. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Any of that speed, even if you can't do a slalom, but if you can get their course and maybe add some more features to it, maybe that's another way to get in there. Yeah, it's, but, you know, I think, uh, again, you know, just not trying to be too serious about the whole thing too is is important because like I said, we don't get paid to do this. You know, we, we get, you know, we, we pay to have fun. So, you know, but I want the folks that go down, uh, you know, I want the folks that go down uh, in this, you know, next summer uh, to have fun. So I think it'll, yeah, I think it'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, no, exactly. You've already seen it once. So you can help temper them and tell them and stick together and give them, give them insights for sure. So I, I appreciate all your insights, your thoughts, your stories, as well as your service to our country. So thank you much. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, it's, that's a hard question to answer, or, or uh, uh, you know, you're welcome. Uh, but, you know, like I said, uh, like I said, thank you for having me on, because uh, I mean, hopefully somebody will get something out of it. But, uh, like I said, uh, I think it's great what you do, too, because, I mean, it, it furthers our sport. And, uh, like I said, uh, in this, you know, this day and age, there's a lot of competing, uh, you know, things out there for folks attention and i think that you know we want to try to do the best we can do to to maintain what we have yeah just i just want to try to bring people's stories and insights for other people so hopefully i'm hearing people they, they like it they enjoy it some of the youtube videos i've done they're enjoying as well so if it can help us i mean yeah, we're spending a lot of time and effort so might as well yeah, study well, a little bit yeah well it's interesting um you know i've found myself I mean, like I said, I, I'm an IT guy by trade, so, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of found myself the last here recently as technology has just continued to, to move forward, move forward. Um, you know, watching a lot of the the uh, uh, bloggers on YouTube, I mean, I'm a, I follow quite a few. And it's just, you know, that media, how that's being picked up, how it's being received by uh, this generation now, it's just really intriguing to me. And, and like I said, of course, like I said, podcasts and how, how we, it's just, it's just interesting. Even like I said, as I get older, I kind of feel like I, I'm trying to move along with the, you know, with the times. Uh, and, and it's, like I said, it's interesting. I mean, I think, like I said, what you do is it's, it's neat. It's, uh, you know, you've got passion to do it. Like I said, good that we have people like that oh yeah yeah no that that and if you have time and the energy and what have you there's quite a few of us i've got to circle back with some people that are doing the different blogging and such in the sport as well and there's other podcasts so that, that's where in the video i plan to do more and more video and different like little series to break down some of these concepts because it is kind of hard to say hey i i laid apex this cone or i enter close to it so i've done some of that in video already on youtube and i'll, I'll try to actually do more of that and see who else i can work with also breaking down different data acquisition that that stuff oh, can be so storm. and I, I mean some of the you know I, I that's one of the things that i mean you know we're kind of down the path now but that's one of the things that i'm already starting to play around with for next season because i think you know i watched you know i watched uh several folks use it and i was like wow that's 
present. And, and, and that reminds you know, me, the virtual reality that I got to use of Kevin Dietz, you're going to see lots yeah. of people watching their runs with VR headsets next year because I did it once or twice, and that was amazing. Did it make a – I mean, did, did you run? You ran. I mean – I uh, I ran it. Yeah, I mean, Kevin put that on my co-driver, and then co-driver came back after run one, and I got to instead of watching his runs on a normal tablet, I got to watch it in VR right. for maybe maybe only got one run per because it took a while to download. But it was amazing, Bill. Turn my head and have the whole. I mean, it's more like virtual reality. You get to look. I mean, I could have turned around backwards and seen. Oh, you hit that cone, but it was amazing, Bill. And turn my head like I got to look ahead. That people right. are going to start and picking you, up on that. You're going to see lots of that. I bet. Did he use a? I mean, was he using like a 360 camera, or yep. what was he using? Yep, that's what was stuck on top okay. of the Civic. And then he, what what was nice for Kevin, he could then later on watch our runs in VR mode. So it's just that yeah. much more real. I mean, and in this case, it was interesting because when I put it on top of the Civic, you're looking down through the sunroof. You can watch the. I can just look down and watch the inputs. Like, oh, yep, well, messed what, that one up. What, well, what's making that so is uh, it's getting. You know the integration of the of the devices is becoming better and better and better. I mean, you know, I was running. You know, I mean, I've got I've got GoPros from GoPro One. I mean, I think I was using like cameras from a laptop trying to do video inside of a car before GoPro even came out. And so, you know, the thing is, it's you know the move from from being able to get the data out of the camera into a laptop to be able to watch it was it was tough. You know, it was it's time consuming. Well, now it's so easy to have synchronized uh, video and data that that you know I think that's going to be a game changer going down the road because I mean the thing is that at at the highest level of the competition, you know the folks that have the ability to be able to leverage that information are the folks that are going to excel uh i mean even it, it makes it will make well and that in cars that are you know i don't want to say that uh, a pdk transmission porsche came in uh you know hey it i always kind of say that the the, the the german engineers that that are still inside of my car makes me a better driver yeah <laughs> but all all of that is just what really is going to make, you know, some folks, you know, either it'll either propel them beyond where they would have been because they're already good, or it'll it'll bring the competition up to a level to where, you know, those without it are, you know, they're going to be wishing they had it. Yeah, and that's where, so I always question, it depends on the person. Some of our national champions don't look at video or data still. But if you are trying to learn, I think it's huge to be able to have that, even if it's VR, that you can look around and say, hey, they're looking around. Where should I be looking? That, for the practice of nothing else to get your skills up, I think is huge. It's so crazy how, depending on your personality type or where, how you've come up to learn things, some people, I'm thinking Ron Williams, doesn't do data or video. He's still blazing yeah. me fast. Oh. So that, that's... Oh, but, and I think go ahead. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have folks that are that are like that. Uh, but you hit, you, I mean, I will say you hit the nail on the head when you. I mean, my wife's a prime example. Okay, she she started last season um, after uh, she had never she'd always come to autocrosses and just supported me. She didn't do it. It wasn't what she did. And uh, we had a uh, kind of we have a what's called a Patty McNeff. Uh, fun day, which is in memory of uh, one of our Porsche Club members that passed away. Um, it's low key, no timing equipment. She went out, she did it, and you know I talked to her. Hey, let's why don't you run the next sun? You know the next day, which was Sunday. This this event was on Saturday, and she started then. All right, and just like any beginner, I mean, I even remember it when I was back in North Carolina. I didn't know what I was doing. And it was tough. I mean, you know, it was a sea of cones, and she. You know, she slowly picked it up, and as the season wore on, you know, she got better and better. And we were in a three-car, three-driver car. The Fiesta was me, her, and Kent Hamilton. We were helping her. It got better and better. This season, it she was light years ahead of last season in the WRX. And by the end of the season, you know, you can see the time gap get smaller and smaller between 
her and myself. And, you know, that was cool. But the thing is, it would have been so much easier, just like you said, to be able to throw a set of goggles on and be able to talk through, talk her through, even when you're not autocrossing. Yep. You know, you know, it can be snowing like now, and you could actually at least just be watching and, and learning where and how to turn your head as you're as you're moving along. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where it all goes in the years to come. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Terrence, thank you again for all the insights. All right. Hey, uh, like I said, uh, I appreciate it. And like I said, uh, look forward to seeing everybody in Lincoln next uh, Labor Day weekend. <laughs> I love it. You're hooked. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, I'm 52. You know, if I, it's, as they say, you know, youth and enthusiasm, it can always be trumped by old age and treachery. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay, we just heard from Terrence. Our next guest is Gordon. Gordon Coonley, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for letting me try that introduction again and again there. I'm going to figure this out at some point. So tell us, where are you from? Where are you at right now? I'm from, uh, you know, the Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota here. I live in St. Paul now, just kind of across town. Yeah. And which, which group do you race with there? What's the name of your local club? Uh, it's actually not an SCCA club. Uh, we have our own kind of standalone club called the Minnesota Auto Sports Club. We do run by all the SCCA rules and stuff like that, though. Very, very cool. So you're familiar with everything, probably have the same packs to make it easy and such? Yeah, yeah. Everything's the same. It's, we run by the same rule books, same packs, same classes, same modifications, everything. Yeah. Very cool. So when did you get started in autocrossing? I started autocrossing, like, I think about seven years ago now. And uh, it took maybe a season or two before I really kind of got into it and, you know, started making every event and, and kind of making a summer activity out of it. <laughs> Be like, I'm getting addicted to this. What, what were some of those first cars you had or, or the car you still have? The, the first car that I autocrossed, and, you know, when you're an engineering student and then you get a real job, uh, the first thing you do is go and buy a Porsche, right? So I bought a 944 Turbo. And so that was the first car that I ever autocrossed. So everything else, you're kind of slumming it. You're like, ah, okay, I'll try something inferior to this. Yeah, well, you know, the 944s are cool cars and stuff, but they aren't a particularly great autocross car. So um, I moved on to an MR2 Spider that I ran um, kind of locally in an under-prepped STR state for a while. Blew up the engine because MR2 Spiders love to blow up their engine. And I put a 2ZZ into it, and then that turned into a track rat, and now I'm driving this S2000 that my co-driver bought, and uh, that's been our car for a couple of years now. Yeah, and you were telling me before before we started recording, so you guys took an AP1 to Nationals. How much did you drive it before Nationals, and what were you expecting headed to Nationals? You know, in terms of expectations, I didn't really have a whole lot. I'm kind of a, you know, maybe top third driver locally kind of thing, and so um, I didn't have a, a ton of expectations about going to Nats, and... AP1 isn't quite the car to have in STR anymore, but this car is really well built. It has Penske's and like an OS Geek and Diff and Tune. I mean, it's prepped to the rules, to the absolute end of the rule. So it, it was. It, it's a great car, uh, just maybe not quite the the car to have anymore. Yeah, no kidding. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at one out the window, going, "Oh, back in the day, the car was in second place, point zero zero two seconds behind." Of course, Nick Barbados was driving it. Hell of a driver. And I just kept wondering, can they be competitive? And most people are saying no anymore. And I'm like, I keep thinking, if you had the right chip program, could you could you get that power out of it to compete with the gearing, I guess? Maybe it comes down to the right course and such. But, yeah, overall, I think it's an uphill battle for sure. So let's go back to – oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking, about your, when you first um, showed up at Nationals, what, what, what hit you, what didn't hit you, what was different about it? Well, you know, Nationals was uh, it was a cool thing. Um, I was kind of not a believer in Nationals. Minnesota Auto Sports Club sends a whole bunch of people. You guys are probably familiar with Little Minnesota. You know, we sp- we send 30, 40 people out of a club that's only, you know, 250 people uh, strong. And so, um, you know, we, we always have a major uh, group of people that go. And I never could, like, justify it from the standpoint of, like, you know, it, it, it's already hard enough to justify standing around all day for six or eight minutes worth of driving. Now you're telling me I'm going to go to this place and uh, do six or eight minutes of driving over the course of two days, probably three or four days by the time you got all the travel involved. It's like, 
that's kind of a hard sell for for a guy like me. But um, when I got to nationals, it just it's such a different experience, and like it's so uh, it's just so big, and it's just all the coolest people driving all the coolest modified cars and doing it really well, and it's just like kind of like coming home. It feels like you know. You know, compared to the 30, 40 people who take it really seriously at a local event, there's a thousand people here who are taking this as seriously as you or more. And um, it's just a really cool place to be, and I'm definitely going to go back. Uh, definitely I, worth it. I got hooked right away. It, it is. I just think back. It's mind-blowing. You're like, oh, my goodness. At least back in the day, there are 60 S2000s in here. Just And like you're saying, just the there's that many more nuts that are out there. You're like, wow, look at the stacker trailers. Look at all the campers just... It's a sight to see. So it's so good that you said that. No one else has said that so far about, hey, I didn't think it'd be all that. And wow, just kind of blew, blew, I don't know, blew up like this is for real. This is different. I want to come back to this. I want more of this. So how much have yeah. you, you were saying at first you didn't race a lot. How many, let's say once again, did you drive this car? How much a season, two seasons? How many events before you got there? Oh, yeah. Um, we ran it all season locally up to that point. So I probably had uh, like six or seven events in it by the time I drove it at Nationals. And how were you guys paxing out compared to, you have some really fast racers there, as most regions do. How are you guys paxing there compared to everybody else? Well, like I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, a, a topper, or, you know, a, maybe a top third or something like that, maybe top quarter on a good day kind of guy. In packs, you know, I'll come, I think my best packs finish in the car was like uh, uh, 15th or okay. so. So out of, Probably maybe 150 or 130, you know, somewhere in that is kind of our, our event population. So. You know, it's just, I like people to set their expectations of gauging how close they are to the top, and it's usually packs wise unless you have somebody that is a national champion in your car, in your class, to really, until you're way up there and you're close to winning some events, it's just tough to do very well at nationals. I mean, it's just, some people I think, oh yeah, I'm top quarter or whatever, I'm top 10%. Well, that's okay if there's some really other fast people there that are national champions you're beating. That's why I'm bringing that up is just expectations-wise. Some people are like, oh, yeah, I've been winning my class. Well, if your class doesn't have anybody that's yeah. a national champion or has got trophies year after year, it's just it's not a real experience like you're saying there are 1,000 people. And like half of those people are, 20, yep. are 25% are super serious and they've trophied or something. It's, it's, it's the best of the best that are making that trek and that journey out there. Yeah, so knowing that we were going to go to nationals this year, we we have a local class that's just a you know we call it pro, um, not that we're professionals or anything, but um, they do we call it pro scoring. So it's like nationals where you where we do three runs in the morning and three runs in the afternoon and then add them together. So you have to be consistent. You have to be fast in three rather than trying to be fast in six or seven. Um, so that helped out a lot, I think, in in the psychological area of preparing for nationals. Also, like I said, you know this pro class, it's it's packed and it has all the guys who go to nationals in it as well, you know? So, um, you know, it, it was a good barometer in terms of like, okay, if I go to nationals, I'm not going to embarrass myself. This isn't going to be terrible. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm also not, probably not going to win or anything like that. Right. Yep. No, <laughs> that's exactly years ago. I somehow ended up in what we call our X class for expert class. And the same thing, it's almost like, wow, I'm getting beat all the time. I went from winning my class to beating some people to why, to, to build it, even compete to get the top three is a big deal. And that's what I would challenge a lot of you. If you want to get better and you don't have any competition in your class, not only compare yourself to those top people, but maybe jump in that expert class or pro class or ask for them to form one. To, not only to be competing with them, to, but to be around those people, see what they're doing, see what you can pick up from them. I sit there and study people, like even Andy Hollis and Pro Solos, and I'm like, he's just sitting there focusing. I'm like, what can I glean from other people to kind of hopefully help myself out at some point? So that, that's, that's very smart that you guys did that ahead of time. I guarantee it set some expectations for you. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely helped us out. Like I said, you know, there's a total different mentality when you're like, oh, you know, the afternoon runs are going to be all that count today versus like, you got to be fast and you have to be clean, you know, and like you have to be good in three, which is a lot different than being good in six or seven. And so it's like, um, you know, that really helped us, I think, prepare. Um, and like I said, yeah, we're in this class with, with you know, uh, 
uh, you know, um, Hobbs and Neil Tobson and, and like these guys who are all, you know, nationally known and trophies and champions and, and stuff like that. So hanging out with those guys and, um, uh, you know, just trying to, like you said, glean as much as you can from them in terms of how they course walk, what they're looking at, why they're paying attention to what they're paying attention to. And really just trying to listen, I think, is, is the biggest one. No um, kidding. I said to somebody else, I'll say to you also, is I would just follow people around and try to hear what they're talking about. And every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, I know David now. I guess I can ask him a question. Or what are you thinking about this? Just being that little puppy dog, just hanging out, just saying, what are, they, what are these fast people doing? Really just trying to pick up yep. from them like a little mentor. And you can do that sometimes, I swear, just by following people. It's, it's that simple. What? Yeah, like, like following people on course walks. That's one thing I like to do. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, and I'm getting to the point where, so if you, if I do this to you, I'm, I'm trying to make myself do it. It's not a mean thing. It's trying to be helpful. When I see people not walking a realistic line, I try to call them out and go, are you really going to get there? And it's usually, are you going to slow down enough to go over there? Like, are you going to set up that wide? I'm trying to do that just because I don't, I don't know if some people are, if you don't walk the line that you go drive, it might be even more surprising when you drive it. So that's something I'm personally trying to do. And I would, I would challenge you all. If there's somebody fast in your region and they're walking way different, ask them. Be like, I thought I'd want to get over here to set up and just see what they say. Be like, oh, if you could, yeah, or you could never get there. Or, so it's just something, yeah, talk to people and ask them and nothing else, at least follow them and see what they're, they're doing. Yeah, there's, there's a couple elements on the uh, Nationals course on the uh, corn side, I guess you'd call it. Um, I forget if that's east or west, but the corn side, uh, that like when you walked it, you were like, oh, man, I should do it this way. And then you watched anybody drive it, and it was totally different than, than the way we all thought we were going to drive it. It's like uh, I'm thinking in particular of this one offset where you're coming out of a left-handed sweeper, and, um, and like there was a, a kind of a large offset that you had to hit. And people were, you know, when, when, when you're walking and you're like, oh, man, I'm going to get like this nice late apex there. And it's like, no, nobody did that. <laughs> that wasn't the line. And I'm sure there were people who were, uh, you know, doing it you know, in their head during the course walk, but we all thought it was a different thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, and it's good to notice that and be like, hey, what I ex- suspected and what actually worked out didn't happen. And that would be the one reason maybe to walk the course after you've run and finished or midday if you've already run, is to see what line. And that's another reason actually to sit there and watch people who are driving the course to say, what are they really doing there? Or if you grab video from somebody who's fast, don't grab anybody's video or somebody who's fast and did well in that course and just see where did they really drive? Because so often what you said reminds me, people think they're going to set up for something and you don't have to. And that, that line's just not going to yep. exist or it's going to be really dirty when you get there. What advice would you have for people who have not gone? Like what would you tell them to suspect or expect or something that kind of surprised you that you'll do different um, next time? My, my biggest uh, advice would be the fact that, um, you know, I, I like, it, maybe it's not like driving advice or setup advice or mentality or anything like that, other than the fact that, you know, I was scared. You know, part of the reason why I didn't do national for so many years was I was scared to make a fool out of myself, right, to show up and be last in my class or something like that. And that didn't happen. I was pretty pleased with my results overall, especially for first time out and maybe not the, the pointy end of the stick uh, uh, car. But I also kind of, like, lost my shame in terms of, like, you know, if you showed up and you did get last and you just had a really terrible time driving or something like that, it would still be a really fun place to be. It would still be with really cool people, and you would still have a great time. And so it's like, to me, you know, like I said, the the cost and then the kind of shame factor were the two things that I was, you know, not really, uh, that that were keeping me away from nationals and, like, when I went, I just realized neither of those things matter. If you show up last on the score sheet, who cares? Man, it's a crazy place and an autocross on a scale that none of us ever experienced, you know. So it's it, worth it to go. And I can tell you there's plenty of people who think they're going to win or have a really good shot of winning who don't do well or don't trophy that year that are feeling as bad or worse than I would think somebody finishing last could be. And like you're saying, if you take it all in – it's such an experience that really makes it worth it, regardless of where you finish. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's just, you know, even if your car isn't the pointiest end of the stick in terms of prep, or if it's not the car to have in the class, you know, like th- there was a guy driving an NB Miata in STR. Man, that's like, I think the AP1 might be outclassed. 
and he did really good. Like, <laughs> you know, and because uh, he's a great driver, and and um, you know, they, he didn't have any shame about it. Why should you? You know, he's having a good time. We're all having a good time. Let's just race cars in the biggest autocross in the world. You know? Exactly. On some really big, big lots that are usually pretty high speed. Oh, did you notice anything that you would tell people or you guys adjust anything for that lot versus other lots you've raced on? Did anything surprise you there? The grip level um, on the concrete at Nationals is incredible compared to all of our local sites. Um, you know, so we, we you think you're getting to the limits of the car and you're just not. And especially when you only have three runs on a course, you don't get a chance to kind of, you know, step it up 5% each run or something like that, especially if you, say, get a cone on your first run, you're, you're in bad shape. So my biggest advice would be, like, go to the test and tune a couple of times because the grip is fantastic there. I honestly think the grip level on Bridgestones there is almost as much as my spec Miata gets on Hoosiers on most courses, you know, on most road courses. It's it's incredible the amount of grip that uh, that that pavement will give you. Did did you guys actually make some test course runs? Yeah, we did. Very. Yep. Yeah, and I would I would do a lot more. Uh, <laughs> you know, the more seriously you take it, uh, you know, showing up there for a couple hours and just pounding out some runs to, like I said, just get a feel for that because it's so different. You know, you think the car is going to slide if you pitch it this hard, and then you pitch it even harder than that, and it still doesn't slide. <laughs> Yep, be like, there's that much more there. And that quickly explains how if you're off the pace, most likely, unless you had big mistakes, like more than one probably, it's just you're not getting to the limit of grip. And it's, yep. like you're saying, that's where doing the pro solo finale, for me, if not, yeah, lots of test and tune, something to get used to that. And for us that are high in altitude, all the extra just horsepower. So you've got grip and you've got power, oh. and you've got to figure out <laughs> both of those things put together. It's like, oh, wow, it's really going, but it's really sticking. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and the elements and the course sizes, uh, you know, are, are 10, 20, 30 percent bigger on average than our local stuff, too. So you also have the extra space to really get into a sweeper, you know, for example, and, and really set the car like almost like in a road racing type setup, you know, where you're not just transitioning the whole time. You're and you get to the limit and you can just ride that and. And and it's incredible, like the the grip there and and the and the courses and whatnot. Yeah. Do you think any of your road racing ha- did help for some of that, since it's maybe higher speed than local or like you're saying the grip level? And you, it sounds like that would actually be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I, I I just got my road racing license this summer, and so I'm a pretty rookie road racer. Like uh, my, my I road race like an autocrosser. I qualified third proceeded to put my car into a sand trap <laughs> so uh spin it or win it doesn't really work in uh road racing as the as the as well as in uh autocross so but uh yeah i do think it does um just the scale and the speeds you know a lot of local autocross seems to be you know between 30 and maybe 55 or whatever but there's a lot of elements at nationals that are 60 65 top of top of second gear even shifting into third um, and, and so having that experience at higher speeds, um, with really sticky tires, um, maybe not as good of a surface. So the grip level is maybe similar. Um, I think that absolutely helps. I think almost any time you spend behind the wheel doing any sort of performance driving is good for you just in general. I think I should even go plug the Xbox back in and hook my seat back up. The kids have taken over. I should be down there. I should be down there. <laughs> So any other uh, yep. thoughts or stories you have from Nationals? Anything fun and interesting you um, didn't suspect? Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, my, my biggest bit of advice is, like, I, I was there. I was scared I was going to make a fool out of myself. And I didn't think, you know, I had the car. And, you know, uh, and I didn't think the price, you know, point and the time was really kind of worth it. But, I, it, you know, having been there, it's, it, it totally justifies itself and so much more, and it's definitely a, you know, even if I go even farther into road racing than I, you know, and, and maybe fade a little bit from local autocross, I'm still going to go to nationals because, man, the event is just incredible. Um, so many people, so many talented drivers, so many really just cool built cars, you know, um, and and it's like the coolest car show you've you, you could ever go to, be, you know, and, that, and then you get to drive cars fast. Like, it's 
awesome, go. <laughs> yeah, good point about the car show. Just there's so many different everything from the stock cars to the things people have made and engineered. And there's like, like us locally. Oh yeah. Chris Dorsey made that really cool looking car. And then you go there like, wow, look how many are in the class like that. It's just, it's, it, it yeah, is there's, mind-boggling. There's 30 of those. Yeah. 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 Like the, the coolest, most sophisticated cars, you know, we get locally are like CSP cars, um, stuff like that. But then you go and watch like the C prepared muscle cars, just like tearing it up. And there's like, they have all home built suspension. Uh, you know, geometries and stuff like that. It's just, like, it's incredible. It's, and, and it's not dumb like a car show when you, like, pop the hook, you know, pop the rear trunk and everything's all, you know, and fittings that are all perfectly anodized. And, uh, you know, it, it's not a build like that. It's just a pure, like, okay, I think I can do this better, and the rules let me do it, so I'm going to do it. Um, and really smart people figured out how to do it, and it, it, it's so much cooler than... Uh, than you even think it is. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's hard to even. I mean, even looking at videos or whatever pictures, it just you just can't take it all in. That how, how large of a site it is, how many people are there. I mean, all the different party type atmospheres, the tents they have now for each little region. If you want one, I mean, it, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing social, as well as just the racing portion, the fun you get to have there too. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, my club is really helpful from that perspective because, like I said, there's a solid you know, 30 to 40, um, guys and girls who go down there. So, uh, you know, there's like all these local people, all, all your favorite local drivers. Plus, um, you know, it, it's like everybody's every region and every club's best drivers and coolest people and best modified cars. I'll just show up at the same place. It's incredible. Yep. Yep. Gordon, I, I thank you for everything. Anything, any other thoughts, anybody you want to thank sponsors, anything? <laughs> um, I don't have any sponsors. I'm not good enough yet. <laughs> not yet, exactly. Not yet. Someone sponsor me. I'm ready. I've got. I've got a car. Put stickers on it. <laughs> yeah, I'll put anybody's sticker on my car. That. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should send some. I should send some. Yes, I should. Well, thanks again for the time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for what you do. Welcome. That was Gordon. Our next guest is Eric. Eric Less, welcome to the show. Hi, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for the time. So you were a rookie at Nationals this year. Tell us, where do you live and where do you race at locally? Indeed it was. Uh, I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I race with the Iowa region. And at Nationals this year, K-Mod, is that what you started in, or what did you start driving, and when did you start driving autocross? Um, I started autocross in 2015 in my 2005 Subaru Impreza, and I raced street modified because that's where my friends raced. <laughs> How nice um, was that to uh, have really, really probably fast competitive cars to race against to begin? Um, since 2015, the street mod class in my region has gotten a lot faster. I, I was already behind with only having a WRX and then they had STIs so I, I, I knew what it was like to be behind <laughs> <laughs> so what so take us from the Subaru and Street Mod what did you do to end up in K Mod what was the journey here um, so in 2016 someone started showing up with a two speed cart and it looked like a blast then I started talking to other people, and one guy had just bought a cart. And at the beginning of the 2017 season, he asked if I wanted to co-drive it with him. And I said, absolutely, that sounds awesome. So, and he doesn't go to many events, so I ended up racing it at every local event. And then I was like, hey, can I take this to Nationals? And he was all, he was all for it. So how many runs did you, or events did you make in that cart before going to Nationals? Um, before Nationals, I think I had maybe eight events, and four of them were on eight-year-old tires. Ooh. So what expectations so did you have a, for, for Nationals? Um, so a little details on the cart is, since it's his, it is a, I don't even know the who made the frame, but it's an 80cc, so it's not even class max. 
So I was already from behind. But is it that much fun? Like, what's the draw? Was it just that much fun to try to figure it out? Um, yeah, it was just the learning curve was so wild. and just, I mean, two inches off the ground. And then once it had new tires, it was it was right up there locally, top five about every event. So you are you are you hooked? Is that something you want to stick with? I I am hooked. I'm actually shopping for a for a real sized go kart. A real sized like give me just a little bit more power, or probably actually a lot more power. Have, did you happen to hear the uh, Paul Paul Russell interview on the podcast? I don't think I heard the Paul oh. Russell interview. But okay, I, I am looking to jump to the one twenty five. Yeah, you want you want to check that out, and this is what you're doing to yourself. As he said, he's ruined himself from driving any car. Because the cart is just so fast, he goes he, anything. He goes nothing compares in his mind to any kind of normal sized car. So you pretty much ruined yourself already with an eighty cc. So you can just imagine what you'll be thinking when you get in a one twenty five. I I could see where he's coming from and completely there. Yeah. So so to break down, what did you think about nationals? You get there. Did anything stand out to you? The size of it, anything else? Camaraderie, parties. What's your take on nationals for the people uh, that are going the first time? My rookie nationals is actually super. It has a great story to it, just from the runs aspect. But upon showing up, it was just so wild of how giant it was. Yeah, I'd only done one national event before, and it was the rallycross nationals. And uh, rallycross is a lot smaller. <laughs> yeah, aren't there several hundred people that show up to that one? Yeah, uh, we just broke a record this year with 123 people. Oh, okay. Yeah, so a little bit it's different. It's a lot smaller. A factor of 10 plus a few more, plus another like two of the sizes or three to get 1,300 people showing up. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, give us some more. Either your rundown from Nationals of the Runs or, or, or give us some more. Well, um, I was talking to people in the registration line, and I got introduced to, I don't know who it was, but he was in K-Mod. Um, and I told him I was on a 85 cc cart, and he goes, "Oh, well, that's interesting." And then he actually found me in paddock later, or no, in in grid when we were about to run. And he goes, "Hey, uh, junior carts are lined up over there. What are you doing here?" Because my cart is significantly smaller, <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a six three two twenty five guy. I don't I don't I don't fit well. <laughs> And what'd you reply to him? But, uh, like, no, I'm here for real. Sorry, uh, it's a borrowed cart. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I mean, yeah, man. What, what am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't, they didn't take my fake birth certificate. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> They're like, I'm giving you a chance here. Oh, it looks like you were running on Hoosier tires. What, what tires did you run on? Uh, so I actually had the engine greens in the front, and then I had Hoosiers in the back because that's all my local cart shop could get me. <laughs> Oh my! So, so you were out there, hopefully, just having fun because obviously your cart or, or your borrowed cart was just not going to be super competitive. Let's say. Oh yeah, I was there to have a lot of fun. Um, the reason I ended up going is because my friend that I raced with locally was driving out, trailering his car. And I was like, "Hey, can I put my cart in your truck and tag along?" <laughs> and he was all for it. I like it. I like it. And that's where I wonder somebody probably will let you co drive their cart to have warmer tires or what have you. That's one thing I tell people. If you're going to head out there and you're not in a competitive car or a cart in this case at all, go out there and put out in the forums that, hey, you'd love to co drive. You've driven this car, this car, and this car. What cars you've driven, what you would drive. Because basically you will help somebody else in addition to helping yourself. Sure. So take us through. Um, I hadn't actually thought. You hadn't thought of so to break down like what else surprised you from your runs or the size of the courses or did you do any test and tune runs ahead of time? Um, didn't do any test and tunes, but uh, after my first run, actually, I found out that my shift linkage had broken because it's the it, at the time was the lowest point on the go kart, so it would uh, grind on bump. And I did the plain side first, and there was a pretty big bump going into the finish that I hit. 
it, it, what it did was it snapped the linkage so I could shift down still, but I was unable to shift up. So getting ready for my second run, I got in and I tried to try to get into neutral so I could get, you know, up to the line. And I realized that I couldn't shift, so everyone I was with that was helping me out in Pat or Eric Grid, they were all like, "What's wrong?" Eric? I was like, "Uh, uh, I don't know. I definitely didn't know all the protocols because they came up. The chief of Grid came up to me. He's like, "Do you want to use a mechanical?" And I was like, "Uh, I don't know." He's like, "I need you to say you want a mechanical." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, I can do, I can do that." And then what's that, what did that get you, 10 minutes? Yeah, that got me 10 minutes, which, unfortunately, I didn't make my second run. And then after that, I think it was F, F Mod was running, and one of the cars broke on course. And that was quite a delay. And had that happened sooner, I wouldn't have needed my mechanical, and it probably would have gotten fixed. But, hey... Bad luck happens. Bad, well, at least at least it wasn't a time when you weren't going for a championship or something or right there and be like, oh, what's going on? Oh, yeah. You'll save that for the next time. Uh-huh. Maybe next year. <laughs> Maybe next year. So basically, if somebody has a, a, a nice cart, you, you're willing to buy one. You're, you're looking right now. You're in the hunt. I, I am in the hunt. I've been looking at one in the Atlanta area, but that's... That's a twenty-six hour round trip, so I'm not I'm not sold yet. You people can ship those, by the way. I, I've, I've I know people have done that, so that, that's one option that might be a wee bit cheaper than twenty-six hours round trip. And or other people that are on the forums or listen to the podcast, they definitely take trips sometimes, and they can get your cart closer to you or all the way to you, maybe. Oh, that I, I gotta look into that. I should get on the forums. Yeah, that that's where. Everyone that listens should realize a lot of people do their own road race autocross or the local SCCA forums and such. Reach out. There are so many people I know that I see it on Facebook a lot. Hey, will you go look at this car for me in this area? Use this network of other kind of nutty racers that will go and look at cars, test drive cars for you, or carts in this case. Because there's somebody probably experienced in Atlanta that knows about carts that can even look at it for you, unless they're a racer that obviously they you should be able to trust them a little more. So that's definitely one thing I'll point out. So, so what goals or what outlook do you have for next year? You definitely headed back to nationals. Uh, if I if I upgrade the go kart, or I guess I could get on the forums and look for a co drive, but I, I definitely will be going back. So, what what's a highlight for for us that you had out there? Um, I just loved the the length of the course and the camaraderie is awesome and. Everyone's helpful, and yeah, yeah. A lot of people drove a long way, and they're they're glad to to help out. I had the same thing happen. A car broke on course. I did miss. I didn't miss a run. I may, oh, I said I'd get in a different car. They had my car put back together by the time my second run was supposed to happen. Once again, I could not believe it. People yeah. just jumped on the car. Had jacks. Had tools. Had spare parts. Cars back together. So that that is what's amazing. You have that many people. And there's always enough people hanging out that can help and are willing to help. So. Definitely, uh-huh. any of you that haven't gone to nationals yet that dare listen to this podcast, find a way to get out there. Maybe you're a co-driver for somebody so you can fly out or ride out or get your cart in the back of somebody's truck and ride out there and tag along, as Eric just said. So lots lots of ways to make that happen for at least the experience. Add it to your bucket list right now and at least get out there one time. Absolutely. And to add to that, um, while my go Broke, and I had other guys in KM coming over offering help, and there was probably ten Iowa region guys around me helping. And someone came up and was like, "Hey, if you can't get it fixed, I have a spare cart in my truck." <laughs> that's how that's how nice everyone is. Nice. You should have been like, "Yes, I'll take that. Bring that over here for tomorrow." Yeah. Have you been in a, in a proper 125 cc cart yet? Um, I've only driven my friends that just bought one in, in my area, but I only drove it for about a hundred feet. Oh yeah. I can't wait to hear the how seat you... was too small. So I, I, I couldn't get in it yet. Yeah. I can't wait to see what you think when you get in a, I mean, the power difference from 80 to 125 in my mind would be great, especially at your weight and size. So, but that's where, Oh, let me think who else is in your class. Was he there this year? 
Oh, he's out, I think, I want to say, oh, Tom Harrington. He's also probably pretty close to your size, I would guess. He was uh, ninth this year, but he's won, I believe, in the past. So another tall guy. Oh, really? Yep. I think he has a bit of a longer cart, so you haven't looked at that yet. Definitely see the options there. And check out that Paul Russell interview on this podcast. He had eye-opening thoughts for people that aren't even in in K-Mod. So any of you that haven't caught that one, Paul Russell, you'll hear the way he breaks down a course. He chunks it into like two or three little sections, and he has a game plan for each one. It, it, it was very insightful. Plus, he comes from the, the cart world, so he gave some input just on, on carts in general and even junior carts. Eric, thank you again for the time. Yeah. Our next guest is Dan. Dan Sims, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you for the time to do this. So so start off with where are you at? Where do you race? I am in the Chicago region. I live about 15, 20 miles west of Chicago. I have a 2009 Corvette Z06 that I race in A Street. It's you know, prep for the class and have a ball of it. So. Yeah. How how long have you been racing autocross wise? Autocross. I started my very first time autocross, which was pretty much my first time driving a car and driving a car in anger. Was the Chicago region has a uh, event called the Learning Curve, and it's kind of an intro to the autocross. And it's uh, it's they they have it every year in April. It's a two day thing. You get tons of seat time, and it's more of a you know, it's not nothing like an evolution school, but more of a, this is how an autocross event runs. And this is, you know, this is what to expect in, in, a, in a typical event. And so that was my first time. 2014, April was driving my Chevy Cruze. And I, uh, you know, kind of planted the seed from there. <laughs> and so I did maybe, I think I did six or seven events in my Chevy Cruze. I put, uh, a little bit better tires on it, but other than that, it was pretty much stock. And then at the end of 2014, I was committed. I was like, i got to get a car for this. So is it, 2015, is it, I ended up... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt there. Yeah, go ahead with 2015. Yeah, in 2015, I ended up... Actually, at the end of 2014, once the, that kind of season was over, late October, I picked up a 2001 Mazda Miata, and I had big plans for this car. I was going to possibly run it, I think... At the time, I was I thought I could run STS, but I, looking further into the rules and you know understanding the rules more and more, like that, that was not an STS car; that would have been an STR car, so that didn't really work out. Uh, but I had plans, you know, to kind of progress through certain classes and maybe do maybe do an engine swap. But what ended up happening with that car ended up being pretty rusty, and I just did not like working on it. So 2015, I kind of did. I think I did maybe 20 events or so, just locally. Um, I just the car just had a sway bar on it. I ran an a- E Street. That was another thing that that was my first real experience in, you know, the a national level driver. We have a few actually this year. E Street Chicago region guys took the top three spots. I don't know if you saw that, but the uh, the uh, um, you know that was me driving my Miata with some of those guys was my first real reality check that <laughs> wow you know my car. Is, my car is kind of on the same level. It's, you know, similar tires, one sway bar. I was on stock shocks, but, you know, they're at a local event. They're three, four seconds faster. And I'm just like, how is that? It, it didn't compute to me as to how fast, you know, how much the driver made a difference. And then that was my first real reality check. But with the Mazda, I, uh, I ended up selling that car towards the end of the year. So I had it for a little over a year, did about 20 events, learned a lot, learned, you know, Learned more a lot not to buy, not to buy a car that was kind of rusty. Uh, that was annoying. Thanks, thanks for the Midwest on that part. But the uh, so then once I sold that car, I just kind of went off the deep end and said I wanted to get my my, my attainable dream car, which was the uh, C6 Z06 in black. So I got that car in early 2016. I did it. I did. Whole bunch of whole bunch of local events was on a not very competitive tire. I was on an old Hancock R3 because it's it's kind of hard finding a right tire for A Street with that car. And then Bridgestone came out with a 305 for that would fit on a 12 inch wide wheel. And then I I was able to get those tires for for this year, and I was finally competitive. And so I just you know it's once you get competitive, it's it's quite a bit more fun. <laughs> even though I'm not a very a very competitive person, but seeing the times there, 
mixing it up with everybody. It's, it's just it's a whole ton of fun. No kidding. Yeah, the, the all of a sudden, wait, I, I like being competitive. Maybe I'm more competitive than I thought. So you yeah. have raced for about two or three years before coming to the Nationals. What, what had you decided to go to Nationals this year? Um, it's just that whole competitive trend. I, I mean, I started the year my first. So I, I actually helped out with the learning curve. And so I, the learning curve doesn't count towards anything, but they let the instructors run. So I guess I was an instructor. So I was... I was still on my R, my Hankook R3s, which were at that time three plus years old. Probably had two, three hundred guns on them. You know, they were done, but I, wow. I, I, did, I had never, I had never really, you know, tasted the juice of a fresh set of tires. So, I was, um, you know, I, I did, a, I did the first Chicago region event on those same tires, and then I was able to scrap together a set of RD71Rs, and I, boom, I, you know, I was competitive and so I, I did a few events and then I kind of just by the seat of my pants there was I saw the the Toledo champ tour was you know less than four hours away um I saw the registration filling up really fast and I just kind of jumped in and said well I'm going, I'm going to my first national event so I did the Toledo champ tour which is at the end of July and once I went there had pretty successful there and then uh it just committed to nationals so nice and so tell us your experience of getting to nationals what stood out to you what kind of blew your mind um so going to nationals i was i didn't really have much thought of it i know i knew that it was like you know the all across event but with you know 12 1300 entrants and i i didn't really I was not really like hyped up on it. I was just like, okay, this is this is going to be really exciting, I guess you could say, but not I I shouldn't say not hyped up, but not nervous or scared about it. I was approaching it like another autocross event, but just it was further away. There's everybody there was you know really good at what they were doing. I thought that you know, at the time I was like, okay, I feel like I'm getting decently good, good enough to to really have fun at this. So. Yeah, did I, you did you have expectations for? Were you thinking, oh, I well, definitely a trophy. I might might get a trophy. How, how did you temper or not no. temper those? No, I I mean I was thought to my head was like, well, I I could trophy, which would be pretty crazy, but I just I did my best to kind of just shuffle those, to, you know, shuffle those out of my mind. So I was just like, you know, I'm going there having fun, not not be dead last, and that was that was really the only thing. I yeah, well, and you ended up in the top half there. Open mind. I mean, you ended up only yeah. everybody in front of you to the trophy spots are all point zero something, point zero something. So you were not all that far out, yeah. really. No. Yeah, the main thing was to just you know have some clean runs that I felt were competitive and you know not not go on the back foot. I should say. Yeah, no, I'm I'm looking oh, there, and yeah, you serve with a cone and a DNF, so you really had to squeeze out that third yeah. run, which is yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> What what's the advice you would give people about uh, those first and second runs? So I was, yeah, those those first and second runs were definitely the least ideal runs <laughs> that I could possibly have in, in that situation. I was, you know, I definitely I don't really. I would say that when I first started autocross, you know, I get butterflies, especially like the first two events or so. I'll get butterflies and you know, get real nervous and excited, but you know, and then just go. But then I've gotten into a rhythm where I don't really, you know, I just focus on what I need to do and then I try to do it. You know, I don't, there's no real nervous or butterfliesness that doesn't happen that much. Whereas when I toned that, that first run and it was kind of mediocre and then I DNF the next run and then I went into that third run saying, well, this is it. That's, I definitely got that feeling back to, you know, this is lots of butterflies, lots, very nervous and just trying to, trying to execute for that third run. So it's, yeah, it was a tall order, but yeah, I managed. So, so the best advice I was given way back when was uh, get a uh, first run in the books that's clean. And yet I've done that as well. Yep. Every so often, you know, do something like, oh, shoot, the whole event is coming down to this one run on the first day. How, yep. how could this be? And can it be fast enough that I can still be competitive? And ay, ay, ay. Yeah, that, that's. Yeah, it was. It's a it's a real head game. That's for sure. Yeah, you overcame pretty well, though. I mean, that was a that's a pretty decent time right there. It's faster than some yeah. of the yeah. Some of the people right right ahead of you were still faster. So, very cool. So, anything else like 
did you get there early and do any practice runs? Did the sheer size of the event or number of cars, anything blow you away or anything that you would recommend people be yeah, aware of? Just the, the overall size of it kind of blew me away. And just walking up and down the aisles and seeing all the cars, seeing all the, seeing, you know, I thought my, my car is, it, it's for the class. And then just seeing, you know, I know there are 15 or 20 of them that are exactly like it. Like, whoa, that's, you know, everybody's, and we're all doing the same thing. We're all competing for the same thing. It's like a, it's a, it's pretty crazy to see all that competition all in one spot. The uh, now as far as how I when I got the, I got there, so I ran Thursday and Friday, and I I got there Tuesday afternoon. I, some of my buddies that also run A Street from the Chicago area, they got there on Monday to kind of participate in some of the activities and watch the other competitors. But I was actually kind of finishing my other vac- my other vacation, I guess you could say. Then I was kind of moving on to this one. That's, I guess, you could call it a vacation. So, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, I got there late Tuesday. Then I ended up, uh, got teched in, got everything set up, kind of walked around, kind of looked at some of the cars, looked at, looked around. Then I went and watched, uh, some of the, watched from the sidelines. I was actually watching E Street run. That's watching the, the local guys there and seeing, Seeing that was was a lot of fun. I, that's another thing is I didn't really watch autocross from the sidelines, but on Tuesday and Wednesday watching that was was pretty cool, especially when you have local contingent to, to cheer on. Um, but yeah, as far on Tuesday once they uh, open the courses for walking, I'm I definitely focused on uh, it, was, it would have been Cornside, yeah, the, the West Course because that's what we ran first. So I I pretty much focused all my efforts to that first course, as far as walking, I think I walked it two, three, two or three times that Tuesday and Wednesday. Got there early, walked it another two or three times. Walked it once, kind of in the middle of the day, and walked it again towards the end of the day. So I think I got maybe six or seven course walks in. And how many do you I'm get a you, at, a, at a normal local event? How many would you walk? Uh, two or three. Okay. Did you feel I, like you overwalked or underwalked at nationals? What do you mean by overwalk or walk? Did you over? Do you think you walked too much? You didn't walk enough, or do you walk? Did, did that? Oh, amount I would feel say. Good? It, I think that, that amount felt pretty good. I think it gets to a point where you just you, you know the lay of the course and well, the difference between walking speed and driving speed. That's one thing that I have trouble doing. That I'll walk it. And I'm like, okay, I, I'll do this. I'll do this. And as soon as I drive it, I'm like, okay, a lot of that stuff is just kind of out the window now. And that's, <laughs> I think that's one thing where it's, you know, I don't, you know, I've only been doing this for just a few years and my kind of lack of experience shows is like, I feel like, oh, I can full, you know, I should, could probably do full throttle here or, you know, try to put my car in this spot and aim this way, set myself up for this and, you know, kind of put a game plan together when you're walking the course. But then when I go and drive it, it's like, well, it kind of just goes out the window. See, Not you, all of it, but some of it. If you go back to the Miata, you can probably say full throttle here and there, and yep. there, but you're in a Corvette. I don't think you get to say that very often. <laughs> no, not really. It's uh, quite a bit different ball game. <laughs> I love it. Is there any other thoughts you have or, or stories or anything else you want to put in there for this, for Nationals kind of thoughts? Uh, I don't know. Well, one thing is that I would say my additional thoughts would be like kind of driving on concrete. That's another thing. Because I... The only other time I really ran on concrete was at Toledo, and the uh, it's it's to me it, it seems like it's a whole different ball game. The car just behaves differently. The grip quite a bit higher. It and you know I there's things that I was doing that I thought was helpful but really wasn't. And like for for example, I was when I was walking the course, I was like, okay, maybe I'll you know set myself up for this section and blah blah blah. And, you know, again, trying to think of what I was doing. Trying to think of, uh, trying to think of, you know, where to put the car while I'm doing these course walks and whatnot, and I would go and try to execute that, and it didn't quite work out. And especially when I was, I watched some of the footage from uh, the other competitors, and I was kind of, I felt like I was going away from my ba- basics because I was trying to take advantage of the difference in the concrete, but I was just causing myself to overthink things. 
But that's a great point for people that, for one, haven't been to Lincoln in this case for nationals. The amount right. of grip there is surprising. It, it, it's a lot. Some yeah. people change their setups. I don't. But that's one thing I love yeah. getting there early and either doing practice or, in most cases, the pro solo finale, is going, wow, yeah. you get to go faster. You get to go faster through all these turns. And that's one thing. If you, yeah. if you realize you've fallen off from where you might usually be, yes, there's lots of competition, but it's, you're probably not getting to that new grip level. You're not somehow yep. able. I'm trying to think how how would you know you would. You're not getting to the point where your car ever slides, so therefore you never even got to the max limit. So I'm always wondering how right. people can figure this out. And it's really whatever you're doing on any lot with less grip, you need to get over that grip limit even there and make sure you do that before you ever slow back down. I guess or before you would, yeah, slow down or, or stop doing the inputs. Yeah, yeah, I think that doing Toledo definitely helped a bit. Toledo was, it was weird because the car felt, I was expecting it to be kind of similar because it's the same, you know, nice smooth concrete, you know, nicely prepped for an airport. In that situation, the car had a lot of push in it, and I was, I feel like one thing that I've learned, in, especially in the past year or so, is that when a car pushes, I feel like there's a lot, I can build up confidence a lot faster and just, you know, get the maximum out of the car, whereas once the car starts to kind of snap on me or doesn't that push isn't there when especially in the corner entry and all that stuff it kind of you know destroys my confidence and i i I can't go fast for example we had an event here down at route 66 it was it was basically sleeting when we started and it was like 35 degrees snow and sleet kind of participating i was on my used re71rs and we had a a section that was kind of a it was almost like a, a straight for you know two or three seconds and i was going into full throttle, but there was kind of a bump in the middle of it. With like a, and the uh, as we went over this bump, the car would kind of unload itself and it would snap around on me. And so I spun twice that day, and it just destroyed my confidence. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, you know, two plus seconds off the leader that day. And, you know, that's just something that I feel like is advantageous to have a car that kind of pushes instead of, you know, is snappy on you. So that's what... Being, that's kind of what I was expecting when I went to Nationals. It was kind of similar to Toledo, but that was not the case at all. The car was quite a bit more loose at Nationals. Yeah, I so, think that's just down the fact that I was on the same the same set of tires that I was all year. The same RE one thirty one R. Yeah, and that's just where even though you're thinking grippy equals grippy, for some reason maybe temperature wise something else, it's just not, and it's not the same surface. Plus. It yep. may be even bumpier. So I've not been to Toledo. I've driven by there thinking I should have gone to that pro solo instead. But also the Toledo's, bumps. Yeah, Toledo is very smooth. Yep. The, the bumps I was talking about, that's at our local site. That was at uh, Route 66. Well, even – so I'm saying Lincoln is bumpier than most people realize, especially right, right. there's certain places on those lots, and it's almost like we always go over a little bit of it. There are bumps. It's an inch or two difference, and it's going to make your car, especially if you're turning, it may skip out. So yep. if your car is – if you if you like the confidence of a bit of push, where the rear end probably is stepping out right there, and, and that's where, especially yep. in a Corvette, you've got a lot more to deal with when the rear end steps out, especially if it's bumpy yeah. or you're accelerating and you hit a little bump there because it can really probably jump out. Yeah, it's just yeah, that's, that's that's exactly it. You know, I like the throttle oversteer, but I only like it when it's kind of down low and predictable. If it's snappy and higher speeds, then that's where. It's, it's uh, a little different. <laughs> yep, yep. So any other thoughts about Nationals, any other good advice like that for people that are heading there for their first time? I would just go in with an open mind. Don't don't overthink it. Treat it like a regular autocross event. Um, don't walk don't walk the course, you know. You don't need to walk the course 20 times. I thought six or, you know, I think I was about six or seven times was, was a good number for me. Uh, um, I totally I, agree with that. That's That's... Please take that to heart, people. If you don't usually walk a course 10 times, don't do it there unless you just are an avid walker that needs to get 10 miles in. Yeah. Another thing is stick with what works. Don't don't try to overthink things. You know, If you've been doing things all year that you feel is a good foundation for what you've done before, just keep doing that. Don't try to get cute and you know try to think of new ways to go faster just because you feel like there's more grip. That's kind of – I thought that that's what I was trying to do, but – Yeah, yeah. It was – do what you do. Yeah, don't don't think, and yeah, I've done do that. Do. Oh, i got to change something, or, or, oh, look, I should watch that person and see how they're doing it. If you're somewhat exactly. competitive, you're not all of a sudden going to learn something new 
that's going to take half a second off or something generally. It's probably going to do the opposite because you're thinking about it instead of just driving. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Another thing is just I was I spent a lot of time walking with a lot of people that had you know a lot of guys that had done it before. There was a few uh, few there's a bunch from our region that have you know been to nationals many times. And so I I always try to walk with them just to try to soak up as much information as I can while still trying to basically keep it in my own routine, but while trying to soak up all this other information. Yeah, I highly suggest that not only nationals, but once again, do that anytime you can. I used to follow those guys around. I was oh, yeah. like their little puppy. I'm like, oh, look, they're walking here. Oh, yeah. And every once in a while, I'd ask a question like, what are you thinking here? Why'd you do this versus that? Or, But generally, just following them and going, yeah. oh, what are they doing? And, and if I could hear them talking to somebody else, great. I would try to suck that in as well. Yep. Cool. Dan, Dan, it's Dan Sims, and I thank you for all the time. Do you have any sponsorships or anybody yeah. or what you do work-wise you want to mention? Uh, not really. I mean, we, we we have our own little race group that we call Boar Racing, which is it, it's actually kind of redundant. It's Bloomin' Onion Racing. So <laughs> all, all the guys that, you know, we, let's see, what is the, we meet every fifth Thursday, so like twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a bunch of people that we all cross with, and sometimes we, we go biking and whatnot. So, yeah, Boar Racing. Yeah, yeah. If you like the people racing, it'd probably nice to hang out with them. Otherwise, doing other activities too. So, Dan, I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. I, I thank thank you for the time and the insights. And are, yeah, thank are, you. Will we see you back next year? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll be around. You're I'll, hooked. Uh, my, I plan on definitely going to nationals, Toledo Pro, and probably Toledo Champ Tour for sure. Those are the three that are. But um, maybe some more. Oh yeah, I like to hear pro solos get out, get to as many as you can, qualify. Yeah, I, that that's something that I'm really excited about. I've I've heard quite a bit, and I I get to experience that. So. Oh, I love it! I'm trying to convert each and every one of you. Of course, that makes it hard because yeah. then all the people show up and it maxes out. But oh well, then we can have more and more of them, hopefully. Yeah. Dan, thank you again for the time. Yep. Thanks for listening. For the show notes and contact information please visit autocrosstalk.com. There you can also subscribe so that we can keep you up to date on new shows as they come out. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on iTunes for the upcoming shows. You can connect to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autocrosstalk. You can share your thoughts, your insights, your questions, your suggestions there. Also, share with your friends. Hopefully you found it entertaining and motivating, and hopefully other people will as well. It's been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and check back next week for the next show.